Hi, thank you. So this is going to be talk about functional data structures and motivation. Uh, about maybe six months ago by now, someone sent an email to the Haskell waiting list uh, saying he had a problem with performance. So he's working over a, a big data set. Uh, it's a Twitter data set, so uh, Twitter messages and user graphs and, and their relations, relations between users and their messages. And he wanted to represent them as big maps. So he basically loaded the whole data in a huge map and then traversed uh, this map, actually many maps. And he came to us because he implemented this algorithm in a few different functional languages. He actually wanted to benchmark them. So a camel, a closure, and a Scala implementation, and a Haskell implementation. And the Haskell implementation wasn't as good as some of the others. So he asked us some of advice. And I felt at the time we didn't have really good advice to give. So we had a solution. Basically, well, you manually internal the string in some string tables, and then you map from strings to ints, and you map from ints to something else, and that way you got okay performance. But in other languages, it just took off the shelf map and shoved this data in there, and, and that was fine. And I thought we could do better. So what we needed to summarize is a fast map that works with string keys and doesn't take too much memory. So you actually use something like 48 gigabytes of RAM. I think we found a garbage question, but it's signing the fix uh, due to a uh, tint overflow because you use so much memory. <laughs> okay, so what do we have today? We have data.map. That's basically our go to map data type for arbitrary key types. Uh, it's a binary tree uh, kind of map. It's representative of the performance of other binary tree like uh, structures like ADL trees or red black trees. Uh, you implement those in Haskell, they perform about the same as the data map. The data map is not a bad implementation of the binary tree. <coughs> Use any keys as long as they can be ordered. I'm sure you're all, all aware of this. Um, so, real world performance data map. Well, in computer science theory, it's pretty good. It's log n. We like log n, right? It's a like small uh, number. But is it really, right? If you have a few million elements, log n, it's not one, right? If you compare it with mutable data so, Packets log n is slow, it's 10, and it could be one that's a factor of 10 uh, slower. And it's especially bad if your data types are chosen to compare. And here's what it's not. Any string like that. And it's the worst case, you have to merge the string, compare anything against every key, every node in the map. And you need more of k log n comparisons in the worst case. Uh, in imperative languages, you know, I saw this problem, we use hash rate. They have uh, over one amortized uh, lookup and insert time, and they need to look at the key in total, and look at the key twice. For one to be hash, and one, once you find a little uh, entry in the array, you need to actually compare it to the key that's already there, if there's a key already there, in case you have collisions. Um, so, I think it was a paper last year, and uh, Milos struck out some comparing containers, uh, talked about the performance of containers in Haskell, and in that way, we had a little neat idea, and in retrospect, it's kind of obvious, but we didn't do it before. Namely, if you have a really fast data structure for ints, and you have a key type that's not an int, well, you can make it an int, you hash it. <coughs> Therefore, so you can use uh, a fast int map for any data type. An int map tends to be in a quite a lot faster than, say, data map. So, so that's the that idea. We can use int maps as arrays, so we can, we can do hashing without doing mutable hash tables. And we actually get some other nice benefits. So if you do mutable hash tables, you have to think a lot about collisions. Because right? you have an array which decides to raise the order of the number of elements you have, maybe 30% bigger. Which means that if you hash put stuff into it, you have collisions, and you have to think about am I going to do chaining or linear probing or quadratic probing or cuckoo hashing and all these bad things. And a lot of the implementation work in a hash table is doing exactly this. In our case, if you use an int map as a hash table, hash map, it's trivial. We, we are hashing space, right? It's all possible integer values. So collisions basically never ever happen. And I actually mentioned this, so, well, I did the math rather. So if you have that many entries uh, in your map, you still have 32,000 single collisions. And 32,000 is pretty much more than that, more than that, more than that. Uh, So you can use any collision strategy. You need a collision strategy for semantic reason, right? You can fail if there is a collision, but you don't have to any time optimizing your collision case. Okay, so take this idea, we can find a hash map, well, just in terms of int map plus a list of collisions. And I did this, and I did also some manual low level optimization in private type. took the definition of int map in Haskell and unpacked the keys and the values into it and said a few words on 
uh, in direction and memory. And this is how that works out. So uh, the benchmark is, at the first place, I have 2 to the 12 uh, entries in the map, I look them all up. Second one is, insert 2 to the 12 element. Third one is, I have 2 to the 12 element, delete them all. And to compare map and this hash map based on the int map, it's about twice as fast for this particular benchmark. And it's quite stable over a key type, so this is for quite strings. Uh, in, if you hit the keys, the difference uh, the improvement gets slightly smaller, but it's uh, in this order always. Which actually means that you never use, need to use int map again. Uh, hash map used at the int key type is as fast as int map uh, due to a uh, clever inline. It actually uses uh, a word or two more memory, so it's not <coughs> quite the same, almost. Okay, so this I, I did uh, quite a while ago. And I was kind of happy with that, but I thought maybe I can do better. Because we know that hash tables still perform better than, than this, if you go back here. And the, the number of comparisons we need to make is smaller, but it's still logarithmic, or log 2, and but down by the size of the bits. But it's still to be a number like 10 or 12, if you have a, a big map. <coughs> and also, there's quite a big memory overhead. So in a hash table, you have maybe 30% memory overhead. Hopefully, I can have some extra slots, but well, depending on your language, say this is C. But we had that 9 words per key value per overhead, which starts to matter if you want to have, as this Twitter guy, you know, 48 gigabytes of uh, map. So if okay. you shrink this, that would be good. Because there are certain algorithms whose performance uh, depends on how much data you load to memory. So the more things you put in memory, the better these algorithms will perform, like machine learning algorithms. Okay, so someone else had a good idea. So Milan had a good idea, and now someone else had a good idea. Uh, in Clojure, which is another functional programming language, uh, they have a hash map type. And it's implemented in terms of this data structure called hash array map try, which is a relatively new data structure. Uh, the paper by Phil Bagwell from 2001. He wrote implemented in C, for some of some my use case he had. And then the chief, he was the creator of Clojure, ported it over to Clojure in Java. So I thought maybe, maybe we could use that. I hadn't tried. So um, I tried, well, someone else tried for us actually, and then that was a bit too slow. But anyway, I had to part it over and, and uh, uh, <coughs> try some more. So just to go through quickly how this data structure works, it's going to be a picture on the next slide. So if you can see the three in your head from these uh, bullet points, I will, I will point that in a little bit. So hash array map try is a little bit like an int map. It's a uh, try, like as an int is a key. But it's much wider branching. So I'm typically maybe 32 in the paper by the tag wall 32. And then you somehow use a part of your hash to index your way down this uh, wide value tree. And there's some other clever tricks. So if you have a tree of size 32 at each level, but many of these subjects are empty, you don't want to represent them because so you have to have a pointer to nothing. And you would like to get rid of this pointer, and there's some clever tricks uh, using. Big population counts to represent sparse arrays so will get there in a minute. So this example, just say you have a key, you hash into this hash, least significant bit is over there, and the most significant bit to the left. Well, what do you do? Well, in the first level, you take five bits, right, correspond to the number between 0 and 31, who's it? And you take the child number, whatever you had, and you continue this way until you get to the So you use, use five bits of hash at each level to uh, traverse the data structure. And it's two node types. It's the array, so the bit map index kind, so the actual array. So you use these are basic use of the arrow key value. That's what you get to in the end. You can stop making questions at this point. And it's up here. Okay. Alright, so how do we want this hassle? There's the, this is the data type that has quite a few cases, so I'll go through them slowly. First, the map of the empty. That's pretty easy. We know that. Uh, then it can be, let's start actually in the middle here. It can be a leaf. That's also pretty easy. That's the key value thing that compares to the very, very end. We actually store the hash of this key as well. Because if we, um, when, when we insert elements and we traverse the tree, we find a leaf and we find ourselves to be, we want to insert at the same point, we need to kind of split this leaf into a new array. So when we insert something, 
you waste the work of men. So. Okay. And, and if you waste the work of men, we get the leads, right? So you actually work actually with one work of men per key value pair. So there are two good arguments for doing the hashing. I haven't tried yet, so that comes out there. Okay, then there's the simple array case. So this is an array of size 32. Right? So we need that to just take the five bits from your hash and you look up and then you get the same guy again. We have handle collisions somehow, so if we for any reason need to uh, store two key value pairs of the keys you know, hash it to the same value, well we have a little array. Which is not sort or anything, it just you have to linearly search that. That almost never happens. It could actually be linearly place, it wouldn't matter much. Because it doesn't really happen. But we need to deal with it. And finally, the, the more um, clever part is this bitmap index instruction. So they, again it's an array, so it, so virtually Theoretically, you can think of it as an array of size 32 again. But we do not want to represent pointers to empty. So maybe you have one leaf and empty, 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 empty. And then we still take 32 words. So what we do is we have a single word in bitmap. But we have zeros if we don't have a child at this position, and ones if we do. So imagine now you want to look up an element in the array position 5. But the array is actually smaller, it's a sparse array. Well, you go to the bit, bitmap. Find bit 5 and then you count the number of set bits below it, and that's your real index in the data. This is a way to represent sparse arrays, and it saves you a lot of memory. And you can see later this optimization to be done. And in the full. It saves memory because it means the array itself can be much shorter. Yes. So it's not 32 bits, so 4 or 5. Right, so it's the size of the number of actual elements in it. Empties, empties do not appear in the tree itself, only at the top. Maybe even refactor this and that happens. Um, indexing into bitmap index arrays are a bit slower, right? Because you need to do the population count of each step. That's why this is also quite useful to have. Because if you know it's full, you just you should do a lot and then right at this position. Um, this, this is it. So, so the, the important parts is really just the leaves and the bitmaps and the rest are either they're considered necessary or optimization. When you insert in the front, all elements must be shifted. Um, yes, so this is immutable data structure. So every time we insert, we, we copy the whole array. Oh. That's a little expensive. We'll come to that in a minute. So it's a, it'd be basically simulating a you know, variable length n tuple somehow, or a continuous n tuple, and using arrays. So like this is one way to think about it. The cache line size is something like that. Yes. There's lots of whole level optimization we do to actually make it possible. Size 32 all the time without having performance that's horrible. Okay, so I implement this using standard and tricks, right? Uh, unpacking to get data representation that's great, compact, not too many pointers. Uh, GHC's new inline whole fragment is great, allows you to remove dictionaries at one time, basically, you get specialized functions for your actual key type. And some low level kind of looking at core and but not, not too much. Um, and even after doing this, uh, lookup performance was, I was pretty happy with it. If I look at insert performance, it was still kind of bad, especially if you compare it to some like hash tables. So I, I was kind of hoping we could get better, except in fact it was worse than for internet. Okay, so I, I wasn't pretty really happy with that. The lookups were great, but as you'd expect, it's a very wide tree. You have to just take a few steps to do some kind of insert stuff because you need to copy. So we need to slice the arrays as you go. As I said, most of the time spent copying the arrays. Okay. Uh, and there was also a few reasons. One is I implement this copy loop in GHG as a loop you know, that the function that indexes the array that will it allocates a beautiful array, that that's a loop that indexes right, indexes it right. Uh, and GHG just didn't compile this as well as I thought. Uh, the, the low level assembly for this loop was and also, to allocate an array, GHC, you need to, you say, new array, right? You give a size and you need to give an element. And the reason is, the array can never be initialized, uninitialized, if it's an array of pointers. Because the garbage collector might traverse it, so it can never pull garbage. When you allocate it, you can fill it with something, a dummy element. But in the case where we're taking an array and then immediately overwriting everything, we're basically first filling it with dummies. And then we're filling it with stuff we want. Traverse it twice, which is the way. 
That's for some reason why it's slow. And this is how I make it faster. So if copying is expensive, you copy less. Hopefully that will be cheaper. So uh, I will use a fan out of 32. Uh, I tried a few different ones. Um, 16 seems to be a good trade-off. It also matches the cache line sizes uh, pretty well 64 bit machines. 8 wasn't uh, gaining as much anymore. We went from 32 to 16, we got a 40% uh, better inserts. From, from 16 to 8 was almost nothing. And one of the reasons there is uh, GHG arrays has a non-zero cost for small arrays that basically have a five word overhead or so, just for having an array. So make it really small, then that overhead is starting to dominate cache line uh, usage, for example. Uh, so 16 seems to be a good trade-off, at least for now. I would like to expand it back to 32 at some point, because of course if it's wider, then lookups are faster. So, but right now, right now I use 16. Okay, so you copy less, or you copy faster, or both. So I do both. How do you copy faster? Well, as I said, this little loop I wrote manually to copy the elements from one array to another didn't compile to very fast code. And there's there's a code generator problem there, but also it's a, a garbage like a garbage um, collector problem. Because as you go through the copy elements, the garbage collector can run at any point, which means that you cannot be pointer at the stuff like this very computation. You need to base some offset index a little bit technical details, but just the takeaway is it's hard to write a fast copy loop in Haskell today. So what we do, we invent the compiler and then optimize the grid. So we implemented some grid mobs for arbitrary mem copies. So GC now has an internal grid mob for arbitrary mem copies. And on top of that, we made some specific ones just for the array hash and the array type we actually use. Um, and the grid mob is, is quite clever. It looks at the alignment of the array, the number of elements you want to copy if it's known statically, and if it's known statically, it does unroll the whole loop. So in my particular case, the full constructor, remember, the full constructor, we know the exact size is 16. So it's I'm copying an array of size 16 from here to here, and we basically just generate 16, well, 16 move instructions, 64 bit wide move instructions. So it's as efficient as you, as you could get it, unless maybe you could use 128 bit uh, vector instructions. And if we don't know uh, the size statically, we call out the C's by copy, which is dynamically to find the alignment and do fast things. Okay, and then there's one more optimization I tried. Um, often you create your map in a linear way. Like right? you have some input data and you insert, 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 and then you use it. So if you use it in such a linear way, there's optimization you can do where uh, you know, from this is implemented in a kind of mutating way, so building a tree, tree by mutating the arrays. Once we're done, we freeze them all. There's an all one freeze operation, which you can see. And then we'll return it to the user. So that puts more burden on me in the implementation to not get that wrong. But if I did right, you can use the array in a pure way, but get about twice the insert performance. If your access patterns are kind of linear, or if your creation patterns are linear. Uh, so I did that, that was for insert, and I did that, it's not a great couple of that, but, but well, I mean, I might as well try to get look up even faster. They were already plenty fast, but you know, always want to be faster. So, uh, as I said before, we use population count, we count the number of set bits, and there's now this instruction for this, and we'll count it, count. Uh, and if you use it, uh, on the uh, architectures where it's available, it gives you about another 12% uh, performance you don't have it to fall back to a kind of lookup based uh, software fallback for population count. So, this is now an optional flag in GG. You can with dash n SSE 4.2. And if you have it, you know, if you use pop count and you're in an architecture where this is supported, you will get uh, faster pop count. But you still have to call like data little bits of pop count, so you don't have to know whether this is the case or not. Um, okay. Benchmarks again. So, Intmap was our first improvement. I went from map to the Intmap base one. Right? And this is from the Intmap base one to the, the, this data structure one, the hash rate, map try one. So, you see, lookup is much faster, twice as fast, which makes sense. The tree is, is uh, shallower. But we can get 48% improvement in lookup without losing too much insert. It still lose 8%. By the way, this is without the pop count optimization. I didn't think it was fair to show it with pop count because uh, most machines don't have it yet. And the leads uh, get a bit uh, not as fast in that case. I think it could be better here. I didn't spend terribly a lot of time on the lead because it's quite rare in programs or many programs. Typical programs create a huge map and lots of hookups and it's all garbage. Um, that's benchmark. Also, memory 
takeaway is this is that based hash map. Um, if you put in 2 to 20 entries in it, but, uh, I mean, then you use 96 megabytes of RAM, assuming you have even keys being values. Uh, and about 6 to 6 megabytes of that, the key is used by a tree structure itself. That's kind of the overhead of the tree. So what's that? It's like two thirds or so of the size is taken up by, the, by tree itself. So and if you go to the hash rate map try version, well, the tree takes less. So uh, 41 megs is there, but it's at 66. And of course, that, that brings down the total because the number of ints we have is still the same. Uh, and this depends a lot about on the fan out. So if you got the fan out back at 42, this number will go down. Or if you manage to get the JC to uh, have a smaller representation for arrays, uh, this number will go down too. Um, there's still, um, uh, you see the leaves take quite a lot, right? This is the leaves. This is the actual interior nodes, which makes sense, right? Because it uh, has a list of fewer interior nodes. So if you could unpack the leaves, for example, into the arrays, you could save I have some ideas how to do that. Uh, and then finally, uh, my, my takeaway is <laughs> master uses. So, this is again compared to the other map, which is what, what people use today. Typically, this is the hash map implement, this is the hash rate map try, lookups four times as fast, uh, inserts almost twice as fast, deletes in between uh, one third and a half times as fast. So also there was this, uh, 
a discussion, it was something that cropped up a couple times since Judy raised. Yes, it's package for um, I don't know if, if anybody's tried those out. I did, I mean, I should benchmark them against this, I'm pretty sure we're faster. Oh, yeah. Marshall or had to go to Judy Race. Oh yeah, but I'm just, for argument's sake, comparing against Judy Race. Even, even if you were benchmarking Judy Race with a seat program. They, they use 255 right, instead of yes. 252. Uh, I mean, they're beautiful though, at least in how we use them in the Haskell package. So. Any more questions? Okay, that's fine. Nice.